Thank you very much. It's really an honor to speak to you. And, and for me, it was a tremendous honor being an engineer to receive the Breakthrough Prize with such outstanding you know, basic scientists in biology and, and physics and math. So I thought I'd start out and tell you a little bit about how we got into this and, and then some futuristic things. Uh, so like I say, I, I, I'm a chemical engineer actually, but when I got done with my degree in 1974, pretty much all my friends went into the oil industry. Uh, but I didn't, wasn't excited about that, and I ended up going to Children's Hospital and working with the surgeon, Judah Folkman. And I was the only engineer in the hospital. And the problem that he asked me to work on was could we isolate what would become the first substances that would stop blood vessels from growing. One of the keys to that is developing a, what we call a bioassay. And the bioassay we wanted to use is shown here. It's basically, a, a, you have a, a tumor, and this is the eye of a rabbit, and a, we wanted to have a slow-release polymer that could deliver over a two-month period because it took a while for the vessels to grow any of the substances we isolated, and they were all big molecules. So we needed a polymer that was inert in the eye and that could release these large molecules for months. Now, the only problem was the literature and everybody we talked to said you couldn't do this. The use of, slow, of polymer matrices for slow-release systems was virtually restricted to small molecules. Now, the only thing I kind of had going for me is, is I hadn't read that. <laughs> so I tried anyhow, and I spent actually several years in the laboratory experimenting kind of Edisonian-like, and I actually found over 200 different ways to get this to not work. But eventually, I was able to make these little microspheres, and here's one cut in half, and we published in Nature that you could use this to release molecules of virtually any size. But this is now the 1970s, and I was trying doing this bio work, and I was a postdoc, and I, 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 and I was trying to get some grant money. And so I wrote money, grants to the NIH, but my first nine grants got rejected. And they weren't very excited about engineers doing um, health-related research. So also, I love being a postdoc, but a lot of my friends said it's not good to be a postdoc your whole life. So. I started applying to chemical engineering departments. And I applied to ones all over the world, and actually not a single one would hire me. They also weren't very excited about bio research. So I ended up getting a job in the nutrition department, um, but, the, and, but the guy who hired me, he, he was kind of a benevolent dictator, and he didn't, like he liked me, but he never bothered to ask the rest of the faculty what they thought. <laughs> so, and that would have actually still been okay, but what happened is, is uh, he, about a year after I came, he left the department, so the senior faculty told me, well, I should probably leave too. <laughs> and actually, one of your colleagues, one of my really good friends is Mike Marletta, and he was giving a talk a couple years ago about uh, this, and I'll just uh, read you what he said. He said, one evening he went to a faculty dinner at a Chinese restaurant with me and some senior MIT professors. He said, a senior scientist sat quizzing us while smoking a cigar, he said, when he heard my concepts for polymeric drug delivery, he blew a cloud of smoke in my space and said, you better start looking for another job. And Mike said he thought he was in a Fellini movie. <laughs> but anyhow, I, I, I kind of kept at it. And like I say, the essay we wanted to do was this. And we actually published a paper in Science in 1976, actually showing for the first time that you could isolate these angiogenesis inhibitors and providing an assay for it. It actually took another 28 years from this paper before the first angiogenesis inhibitors would be approved. In fact, the first one was by Napoleon Ferrara at Genentech who won this prize. But now they're very widely used drugs all over the world. Some of them are the best-selling drugs in history, and they're used not only for cancer, but also for eye diseases like macular degeneration and diabetic retinopathy. And the drug delivery systems we did as well are, are widely used by maybe over 100 million patients every year. This is just some pictures of them, different microspheres you inject underneath the skin to deliver drugs for a long time. And you have to do this because otherwise the drugs are rapidly destroyed. So, so that's kind of how I got started. But you know, to, to move into some of the things I wanted to go over today, when, since I was at the hospital and I was working with materials, I was curious, how did materials find their way into medicine? And what was shocking to me when I looked into this is almost always it was a medical doctor who was driving this work. And what they'd almost always do is take a material from their house and use it uh, in medicine. So if you look at this, the artificial heart, for example, as I found, was made out of a lady's girdle because it had a good flex life. And the breast implant was like a mattress stuffing because it was squishy. And I just thought we could do better. 
you know, I thought we could use chemical engineering design to, to make things from scratch. And so we picked a number of examples, and I'll show you a few. Um, when we started, the only material that was um, FDA approved, it started out looking like this, and then it got spongy, and then it, fall, it fell apart. And so we started using, uh, thinking about what, what do you really want in a polymer? And we said, well, we really like it to dissolve like a bar of soap because then it couldn't dump out the drug. And we actually went through, and I, I won't go through this just in the interest of time, but a whole set of chemical analyses about what type of polymer might work well. Uh, we chose this copolymer, which I'll show you here. And, and then we started collaborating with people using it to do local delivery to treat cancer, in particular brain cancer. But when we wrote grants, pretty much every year, we'd write them, they'd get rejected. And because um, and, people said, well, you couldn't synthesize them, they'll react, uh, they'll react with whatever drug you put in, or the polymers are fragile. So every year we'd get a different objection. That was actually one of the reasons I started writing patents, because the companies didn't care about all the reasons they wouldn't, this wouldn't work. So at any rate, uh, that kept going on and on until 1996 when the FDA approved it. And this is just a picture of one of the systems. It's a little wafer going in the brain. And this got approved in uh, 1996, and it's been used now for the last, it's the treated is the, um, you see the treated in the controls, and it's now been used in over 30 countries for the last uh, 22 years. And, and, and it provided this idea that you could do local delivery to a site. And so one of the other things that people began doing is, is one of my students, Elazar Edelman, is, well, there's these things called stents. These are uh, Chinese finger puzzles. They look like this. But you may know that 50% of the time when you put them in the body, they cause smooth muscle cell prolifer proliferation. <clears throat> so basically, what's now done is exactly the same thing. You take another anti-cancer drug, Taxol, coat it with a polymer on the stent, and it locally delivers a drug, and, and million, you know, over a million of these are used every year. And, and we kept thinking about other things that might be useful for the future. So one area that I also saw at the hospital was minimally invasive surgery. Years ago, if you had a gallbladder operation, what they do is they'd operate on you, they'd take the gallbladder out, you would be incapacitated for a, a month in the hospital. But now, what they do is they make a little incision and they pull the gallbladder out through this minimally invasive surgery. They're out of the hospital in less than a day. So I started thinking, you know, gee, if you could take objects out of the body through these little holes, maybe we could put them in like medical devices. And so I started thinking maybe we could create what are called shape memory materials, materials that could start out looking like a string so that they would go through this little hole, but then when they get in the body, we could either have a temperature change or a light change, and they'll change shape. And again, this can be done by creating, uh, for the polymer chemists in the audience, multi-block copolymers with switching segments. I'll just show you an example. So what I'm gonna do is show you a string at room temperature air, and we're gonna drop it into body temperature water, and I hope it changes into a coil, sort of mimicking this stem. So let me try this. Yeah, here's the string, and then as soon as it went into the water, which is higher temperature, it changed shape. Another thought we had is, you know, let's say you wanted to tie a suture in the body, uh, like, and if it's in the outside of the body, it's pretty easy if you have a wound. Like, I could do it. You wouldn't want me to do it, but I could do it. <laughs> but inside the body, how could you do it? We thought, well, maybe we could even make the sutures tie themselves. So just as an idea, you could make a loose knot, loop it in, maybe in the stomach or some other place, but then when it changes the temperature, you shine a light like with fiber optic, it'll just tighten. So let me show you a second video. You can see the uh, loose knot, now it's gonna tighten as soon as it gets into the water. So, so those are some examples. And then another whole area we started thinking about is could we combine cells and materials, this we did with Jay Vacanti, one of my friends, to make new tissues or organs. This is from, a, oh, I'm sorry, before we do that, I'm gonna just show you one other idea, nanotechnology. Could we make nanoparticles that could target to tumors or use them to deliver things like, well, when we thought about this, it was for tumors. Now, of course, a lot of people are using it for RNA, and we've been very involved in that ourselves. And, of course, you heard about RNA a lot, and you'll hear more about it. But just to show you this video, I, I, I feel like I don't explain it this well, but Nova, the TV show, they came to our lab, and they filmed it, and they do a much better job than me, so I thought I'd show you the video they made. Here it is. He starts with a nanoparticle of anti-cancer drug. That gets encased in a plastic that releases the drug over time. That, in turn, 
gets a special wrapping that disguises the package as a water molecule to fool the body's immune system. And last but not least, the address where it should be delivered, a key that will only fit the lock of cancer cells. I, I should point out that a lot of the clinicians I work with tell me it doesn't blow the cell up quite like that. But you people are now using lipid nanoparticles and polymer nanoparticles for all kinds of things. In fact, another RNA therapy uh, with Elnylam, that's a company I, I do a lot with, uh, just got approved earlier this year for another rare disease, ATTR, amyloidosis, and Moderna, another company I've been very involved with. They are in 10 clinical trials for delivering messenger RNA for treating different diseases. At any rate, the, and what are some other things where materials might help in the future? So here, Jay Vacanti and I, he's a surgeon at Mass General, had this idea that maybe you could take cells, combine them with materials, and grow them in a bioreactor and make literally virtually any tissue. Um, this was a paper we published in Science. It's been cited about 7,000 times. And uh, just to show you a few examples of what's been done, uh, here's cartilage. And here is a study where uh, you put cartilage in nude animals, and you can redo this guy's skull. And you can redo this guy's cheek. If you open the animal up and look at it, it's pure white glistening cartilage. And histologically, it looks like cartilage. By the way, it's not perfect cartilage. It's not strong enough if anybody's a runner. But you can use it for cosmetic purposes. So the Army came to see Jay and myself and Linda Griffith, who was one of my postdocs at, and actually is a Berkeley graduate. And uh, they, they'd see patients who didn't have ears or things like that. So they said, could we help make new ears and other body parts? So here you see uh, an ear on the left side. And this is a high-powered scanning electron micrograph. These polymers, we make them biodegradable over time. But you can see the cells proliferating in extracellular matrix. Ultimately, the polymer will fully dissolve. And, uh, and, and, and then you um, will get the ear. And in fact, uh, they, they put this on uh, rabbits. And uh, it's actually even been put on humans. So basically, here's a little boy. He's 12 years old. And like other 12-year-olds, he likes to play baseball. But if he ever got hit in the chest with a baseball, he could die. So actually, Jay, my colleague, he, you know, we made polymers, took his own cells, and made him a new chest. He's now an adult and, and doing well. And it's also been used to make new skin. I'll, I'll just, that's actually FDA approved. Here's a little boy, very badly burned. But you can take a product. Next slide. And... Uh, and, and you can cryopreserve these. It's fibroblasts on a, um, a polymer scaffold. The next slide shows you what happens when the little boy, we put it on at time zero. Let's come back uh, three weeks later, and you see he's doing better. And six months later, on the next slide, he's pretty much healed. These have now been approved for skin ulcers and for burn victims. And, there, and you can actually also now, as people may know, you can use these technologies to grow organs on a chip. Uh, to do drug testing. And I thought I'd just end with one last example that we've been working on, again, more with the idea to the future. Could we actually someday make a fully functioning pancreas? This is, is, people have tried this for a long time, but the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation came to see me a number of years ago, and they said, well, the biggest problem, see, all these that we're doing is like you might add immunosuppressive if you're worried about rejection, but the other way of trying to solve the problem is to encapsulate cells like, like beta cells. And, and, and in what's called an immunoisolation membrane. And the idea is that if you got the pores just right, then uh, insulin and glucose could diffuse through it, but antibodies or immune cells would be too big, so it's immunoprotective. And, and there's a substance, alginate, from seaweed that you can actually aqueous, you can do a very simple encapsulation with water, and then you just shoot it into a divalent ion, like calcium or barium, and you look at how the cells are encapsulated. So Dan Anderson, who is one of my postdocs and I, uh, we actually came up with this idea of some combinatorial chemistry, literally made thousands of alginates. Now, most of them didn't work, but we found a couple um, that did, and this is even in non-human primates. And just to show you what happens is if you normally look at what happens to an FDA-approved catheter, it gets encapsulated, but if you coat it with our stuff, it doesn't at all. And uh, we actually published six. There'll be seven papers uh, in, in different nature journals really going after the mechanisms of these to, so that you really understand how to get good biocompatibility. And then we published in, um, and this is the last slide, 
uh, with Doug Melton, we took his, uh, his beta cells and put them in these capsules and basically cured uh, animals for about a six month period. So again, still in, in animal trials, but the goal was to tell you what's gonna happen in 10 years, and my hope is that a number of these things will, we'll see. So again, really been an honor to go over this with you, and, and, and I should say, as, as everybody here has before me, you know, all this is really due to the people in the lab that do the work. I mean, it, 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 you know, I, I've just been lucky to work with great people. So thank you so much for having me. I mean, from your presentation, it's as if you're already thinking 10 years ahead right now and making it happen. But curious, what, what do you imagine uh, for 10 years' time? Well, I mean, it depends on which area, but I, I, I think, you know, you heard earlier about RNA therapies. I think we'll see a lot of that in 10 years' time, all different types, you know, and you've heard about gene editing. I, I think we'll see examples of that. But... Uh, you know, you, one way to look at tenure, medicine is slow, uh, as the angiogenesis example I gave, you know, from personal experience shows, you know, 28 years from, you know, the initial discovery to a clinical product. But what you can look at is all the clinical trials. And if you look at the different companies doing clinical trials in all these areas, it's, it's really exciting. So I think, you know, what Adrian said before lunch is exactly right. I think, you know, whether it's antisense or siRNA or messenger RNA or gene editing approaches, DNA, I think we'll see a lot of that in the next 10 or 15 years. I think that that's really exciting. I do think, think we'll see more and more cellular therapies. I think the CAR-T example is, is a really exciting example of that, and I very much hope that the kinds of things I talked about in regenerative medicine will be also. So I think those two areas to me are, you know, in terms of moving from sort of the basic science to something that will really help people, I think we'll see hopefully a lot of that in 10 years' time and a, and a lot of treatments that'll help a lot of people. Are there any ideas that, you, that, you, that are at a really nascent stage in your lab which are kind of far out and, and, and may have a very small chance of working but, but, but could be transformative? Well, I could probably mention some and people will probably go back to thinking that I'm nuts, but I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Um, you know, I've had ideas, for example, about how you could change like hurricanes. Um, I, you know, where you could actually interfere with hurricanes and actually um, try to, again, this is the chemical engineering principle, so where you could affect, you know, hopefully move a hurricane, let's say, that could wreck New Orleans if you knew it, and that was coming, and move it into a tropical storm. I mean, that, you know, that, that, that's one example. I mean, that's not a medical example, but uh, we, we, we probably have some of the, we, there's a number of those, too. Okay, thank you. My pleasure, thank you.